I mean, nobody should do this thing alone because it's really stressful. No, I've seen yeah. that maybe back benches are usually more successful and they are very jugadu. <laughs> That's what I, I will tell you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they have more fun, so yeah, I think yeah. let's 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 say that. <laughs> right. I I still believe ours was the closest to what Elon wanted. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone, welcome to Conversation with Kushal once again. Today we have with us one young chap who has worked in companies like Matrix Partners, McKinsey, Axel and is now headed for his MBA to Harvard Business School. Thank you so much Vandit for accepting my invitation. It's going to be an absolute pleasure to host you and discuss your entire journey which is definitely going to inspire thousands and thousands of individuals. Thank you so much, Kushal. First of all, great initiative. Uh, really appreciate you reaching out and thinking for the broader interest of people. Uh, I was figuring out how could I help uh, and like maybe like people know about my journey because a lot of people came handy when I was applying to Harvard, Stanford, and Wharton. And nobody, I believe, um, I mean, nobody should do this thing alone because it's really stressful and a little guidance can take you far along. So I'm not sure about thousands, even if it help, if it helps uh-huh. like for people, I'll be really helpful. That will be really really grateful. So let's let's do this. Right, definitely. Thanks, thanks so much for that. Uh, means a lot to me, and uh, I think this is definitely like uh, going to be like an eye opener for people who want to get into, let's say, venture capital or consulting or even an MBA from an Ivy League and all of that. So before we get into yeah. all these, right, like let's discuss your early childhood first. How was your early childhood? How was the education system for you over there? Were you like a first venture, back venture? How was that <laughs> entire uh, upbringing and phase for you? Oh sure. I grew up in Jammu and Kashmir. I grew up in the city of Jammu. Uh, so I spent like uh, first 15, 16 years of my life in Jammu did not step out for education. I uh, studied in a government co- a government school in Jammu and Kashmir itself. Uh, so my, my parents were doctors. So I think uh, education was always very, very important in our family. Uh, although they wanted me to become a doctor, I let them down there when I chose not to take biology as my subject in 11th and 12th. Uh, I think very early uh, I had this, uh, I love mathematics, right? So problem solving was what was my, my like intuition and gut for problem solving was guiding me throughout. So I thought engineering would be the right fit for me to begin with. So like every other student started preparing for IIT J, uh, landed up in Bits Pilani. Uh, and I think Bits Pilani was truly transformational. I think it was the first time I was going to live outside of my home state and home city for a prolonged period of time. Uh, and I think in Bits Pilani, more than the academics was what shaped me and what shaped my journey was probably the activities which we got to do outside of the classroom, right? Uh, so Bits Pilani had no attendance policy. Uh, so we started figuring out things to do. And I think a couple of experiences which were really, really pivotal were I got to be a part of this Hyperloop India team, right? Uh, where we all, a team of multi, a team of students from multi campuses came together, multi years, right? Different years of people working together. Uh, we built a Hyperloop pod, got a chance to travel to SpaceX in the US uh, like see Elon, Elon Musk and it was like it was like seeing him in front of you and realizing oh my god this person is like moving the world from whatever he's doing right? so quite inspiring uh, I also got a chance to hit the placement unit in Bits Pilani and I think uh, there again I started reaching out to a lot of uh, people and I realized how helpful the Bits in Alumni base actually is right uh, and I think uh, that is where I started developing uh, I wanted to I wanted to take the problem solving thing further and consulting probably was the right choice for me so yeah, I think after that ended up in McKinsey and Company. So that's that's what growing up was like. And I, to answer your question, was a bad bencher or a middle bencher. <laughs> Never had the guts to sit, sit in sit in the front of the class. So, but I think that that went well. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. No, I've seen yeah. that maybe back benches are usually more successful and they are very jugadu. <laughs> that's what I, I will tell you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they have more fun. So yeah, I think yeah. let's 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 say that. <laughs> right. No, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about your journey before getting into Biz Pilani, Right. Like, uh, how sure. did you? ensure that you want to get into Bits Pilani itself how was that preparation phase for you and if someone yeah. wants to get into a college like Bits Pilani right like what is mm-hmm. it that they should do right from the beginning itself so that they can also dream of getting into mm-hmm. universities like Bits Pilani yeah no I think coaching goes a long way first of all uh, I think you I am not saying that one cannot do this without coaching but I think the path becomes easier right and you don't have to know what to read and how to read and what to finish in what amount of time so uh, coaching came really handy I joined coaching classes and I think being regular and I mean uh, there's a so it's like it's like firefighting honestly 11th and 12th preparing for J's there's just so much ground to be covered and so many new concepts are showered on you so I think just being consistent and I think uh, making sure that you are in an environment where you can focus uh, study properly right and I think thankful to my parents they provided that early and uh, I think the in- if the intent is there then you uh, just just log for two years to be honestly uh, to be honest and then uh, it happens 
so i think intent and some good guidance and good coaching goes a long way right so where had you joined your uh, coaching classes and if people want to join like what are some of the best ones yeah. you can recommend them although well, i know the long back then, yeah 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 so back then i did not have many options in jammu right uh, i wanted to go to kota but i remember there was a long debate and at house and i i chose to stay back uh, home uh, but then i joined akaf coaching classes uh, i don't know i don't know how they are doing don't recommend anything do your own research times have changed i prepared for jee long long time ago uh, all that i'm saying is uh, there are many many more options today there are so many coaching classes right so have a have a good peer group who is aiming to go to like good colleges and have some good coaching where you can get the right guidance uh, and i think just i mean just work hard yeah right and then like once you got into bits pilani right uh, so yeah. how did that entire like it it would be a four year uh, degree like four year degree right yeah so i was in a five year degree i was pursuing yeah. a dual degree yeah yeah i did bachelor's of engineering in electrical electronics engineering and i did masters in science in biological sciences oh okay this sounds very yeah. complicated to me so i am from a commerce <laughs> background i don't understand each and yeah. like anything about science or technology right, if you right, can just right. help people understand in terms of what are the various branches in bits pilani and sure. how do you decide which branch to get into how does that happen yeah. so bits pilani is very unique in its ways that it offers you both single degree and dual degree and the dual degree is different from the degree dual degree offered in iit is in a way that you can choose a science degree and pair it with any engineering degree right uh, so single degrees i think are out there like same in every college you do computer science electrical electronics mechanical chemical civil right uh, a manufacturing or a couple of other sister branches to what i already talked about uh, in bits pilani you can also choose to enter college with a science degree there are five options you could do biological sciences chemistry mathematics physics or economics right so uh, i i thought that okay uh, i did a little bit of research and realized that biological sciences with like a computer science or with like an electrical electronics had a lot of scope for interdisciplinary research right so like a lot of new stuff was coming up so i spoke to a cup um, one of my uncle who was a bit sin uh, i spoke to one of the faculty members at bits pelani who i managed to connect through a cold email and they all really pushed me to even to to go for a dual degree right so i entered with a single degree and then depending on how you perform in your first degree depending on your cgpa you get your engineering degree so that's how it works it's a five year integrated course where you get two degrees at the end of the course right so uh i mean I'm, i'm still an engineer but i have the added degree with me of a master right. in science got it are you also like a big fan of cold emails and uh, getting your work done or approaching someone through cold emails oh absolutely i think a uh, high agency and uh, taking the initiative goes a long way right if you if you will never ask you will never know right. so i i i keep uh, sending emails a lot of them haven't been returned mm-hmm. but i think the ones which have returned and especially when i say guidance right uh i think asking people who have been there and done that uh really helps it enlightens you it opens up paths which you did not even know of right uh so cold emails reaching out to people and one thing which i've realized is people are more helpful than you uh realize okay we might have this inhibition that okay i'll reach out to this person but i'm a nobody but trust me even that person has gone through the similar same journey right so people are more than willing to help so yeah big fan uh, i'm saying once i once i head to the b, b school i'm yeah. planning to write more cold ah, emails okay. to meet Got people it. in us yeah. and hopefully some will get returned no definitely i'm sure like uh, your conversion rate would be much higher as compared to the industry conversion rate which is there but tell me one thing what is the <laughs> format that you follow while writing a cold email if you can help everyone understand so even we we'll get to know like how do you write a cold email and all of that so i'm i'm no expert i think uh, i believe that okay if you want to learn something uh, start your endeavor for for example if i were to write to an operator in an industry right let's say somebody is working in the product division of a let's say saas company and i want to learn how they work right so i would try to probably read up a little on that industry first and see if i could be of any help to that person right so when you block 30 minutes with anybody i believe that it's they are giving you the time and it's it's very precious so uh, i bef- i don't want to keep it transactional i want to keep it very conversational so i i be very clear and upfront on who, who i am what i am seeking this these are the three things i would love to learn from your journey but by the way i also read up and i have some few connects in my uh, in in my industry and i think these things if you read up will be really beneficial to you so although agreed i think because i'm the one writing i will end up gaining more so i try to be very upfront on what i'm seeking and how i could also be of some help 
uh and yeah i think uh being uh, i mean just 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 be, uh, be just send it out right just say have a subject line which compels them to open the email and then just have a very very candid email talking about what you want to learn and why you think uh, this connection will be really helpful what are some of the popular subject lines that you have used and you have got a reply from that person help 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 <laughs> i'm just kidding <laughs> they all they totally it totally depends on your yeah, the context but uh, i don't remember any but yeah uh, i mean whatever is the context being up front right got it no so for example like in my case right if i am reaching out to someone for a podcast i yeah. used to like i i just mentioned like interview invitation community of 500000 professionals mm. and i think that subject line has helped me in order to just uh, put yeah. it out right up front that okay what is the purpose what is the objective mm-hmm. and then like following a 3 4 para cold email formatting where you introduce yourself mm-hmm. go straight to the point right. agenda and then just yeah. write a cta of what are the next steps you are expecting so that Got is something it. which has really helped me as far as cold emailing is concerned but yeah even i am a big fan of cold emails like you yeah although yeah. i don't think my conversion rate would be as high as yours but <laughs> i no, no, no i i don't i don't agree <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so yeah. Uh, walk us more through your uh, experience of with pilani i uh, heard that you yeah. were part of that hyperloop and uh, like all of that project so how how did yeah. that happen and uh, what are uh-huh. some of the things that uh, those kind of experiences taught you as a person yeah uh so i think the it it all came from an itch uh, when i started reading my core subjects of electrical electronics mm. i was just questioning myself that what i am reading how is it any different from a batch which graduated 10 years ago from me and sadly the question was nothing is different and i just questioned myself like is it okay is it okay to read something and not apply uh so i just was on the lookout of what is happening in technology and what is latest right i started reading articles and i think the talk of the town at that time was this white paper which elon musk had written uh, which talked about a revolutionary uh, transportation technology so i think the last last level revolution in transportation as a sector was steam engine which is anybody's guess like 100 years ago i guess so something so aspirational uh, he wanted students across the globe to achieve right uh, and i came across a, a couple of people on campus who had taken the initiative to start this team out right uh, i remember i was in my fourth year and probably everyone from my batch was focus, focusing on placements at that time but the urge was so compelling to be a part of this thing in no matter what capacity that i reached out to the team uh, again i think i was able to add some value to them in terms of sometimes in engineering sometimes in sponsorship sometimes in some case study uh, and it was a it was a joyful ride uh, again i think uh, it was a it was a gut call to join the team but i think those that was one of the gut calls which has uh, made me be with people who really want to do something learn a lot from them like being in that charged environment right it's 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 easy to be in a student team but a student team who has set out to achieve such a massive thing uh, you won't believe i think we ended up uh, raising north of 1 crore rupees the team was like 100 people strong and there was no other student team like that right and we got a lot of good publicity uh, because of the work which the team as a whole had done uh, in the end i think uh, there were two competitions we participated in we participated in a case study competition uh, we did really well in that i think we were one of the top 5 teams the second was the engineering team which uh, again i think i could contribute less to because my bent of mind was more towards problem solving and consulting uh, but i think they also did exceptionally well right so we ended up like a lot of people from our team went to uh, hawthorn uh, in in california here yeah. and flew down to the spacex office and i think the whole journey uh, what started as okay let's let's give it a shot was very transformational i think uh, a lot of you won't believe it a lot of between startups which have come out uh, and you, <laughs> this gives the feel of paypal mafia where a lot of people who started paypal together that did a lot yeah. of things later but a lot of people from the hyperloop team have started uh, great startups they have gotten great funding even if like most some of them haven't gotten funding all the projects which they have built are moonshot projects they are, they have been like hey, let me revolutionize the music industry let me revolutionize artificial intelligence space so like that dna wow. has stuck with the team can you and, give some uh, examples think, of some startups uh, like yeah that, yeah pixel that. pixel i think uh, avis was part of the team uh, sibesh who was leading the team back then started a startup called uh, myra uh, there was a, a friend of mine prithvi he started a company called hamid so multiple startups have come out of it and i think m- m- many of them have done exceptionally well right uh, so i think that dna has really stuck with me i think even i for, for people who know me know know that i want to 
probably uh, try a venture at some stage in my life, right? Uh, so I think uh, that was a very, very transformational experience uh, being in the Hyperloop team. Okay. That was one of the experiences, yeah. So second, I as I mentioned, I think, uh, if you have more questions on this, we can take that. Yeah, so one question which I had was like, what exactly was the project? What did you work on uh, this particular yeah. team experience? And how was so, your entire uh, experience meeting with Elon Musk? And like, how was that? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so Hyperloop, so basically let me tell you the technology first. Uh, so, and I've spoken about it so much. Uh, so imagine a tube, imagine a straw, but there's vacuum. Okay. So whenever a car is moving, there are two types of friction, which is stopping it. It's the road and it's the air, right? So the idea is you levitate the pod. So in the straw, there is a levitation, there's a flying, uh, like pod, which is not touching anywhere, right? So there's no ground friction. Now the second time of friction is what the air friction. So you vacuum the air out and there's no friction at all. So you propel it using like a fan or something like some motor and then it achieves speed, which is theoretically like, let's say 800 kilometers per hour or even higher. Right. So imagine like faster than a bullet train, like double the speed of a bullet train. Right. So that's the theory. Uh, so what we ended up doing was there were two competition. One was that, okay, you bring your own prototype, like do not build like a full fledged pod, build like a smaller pod. We have built a tube here and you run your pod. Let's race. So different people, like I think multiple pods are there from Germany, Japan, everywhere. Asia, so I think there were only two teams. One was ours and one was from Japanese team. But across the world, there were like multiple teams, multiple pods. Everyone had gone like bizarre and they built up different types of pods. So we all took our pod. I think I'll share a photo with you later. Yeah, it's on my it's Instagram. Yeah. Um, right. So that is one. The other competition was... So the question was, if Hyperloop were to become a reality, right? And it takes time because first of all, you start with cargo, you cannot just risk human lives, right? Then you put humans into it. If it were to become a reality, then bring a case study, which talks about why should we as an entity bring Hyperloop to your country? So we divided it into multiple parts. We chose the route first. I remember it was Bombay, Bangalore and Chennai, right? Because connecting like three big industries, right? So IT industry, Bombay is like, Bombay is Bombay, financial capital and then Chennai are so much of automotive activity. So we were like, people will actually be able to travel, stay in one city and work in another city and still travel like within an hour or so. So we built the whole case study talking about this is the route which you should take uh, and why, okay? What is the feasibility? What is the population which can go through? What is the cargo? How it will decongest ports, right? Ports decongestion is a big problem. And I think something as fast as Hyperloop can decongest ports also. So we picked that, we talked about the government policies which will be helpful. We made a whole budget of how this can come in India, right? What policies will help you? So that is the case study which we built, right? Um, and I think that case study ended up winning that Hyperloop one global challenge. So it was a, it was a very very uh, great uh, experience and the kind of people uh, Sibesh I remember used to push her, push us a lot he he's an enigma to be like to call him in one word uh, and then later on I remember meeting uh, so I, I remember sitting in the stands in hyper uh, this this guy named Elon Musk was changing the world walks out of his Tesla uh -huh. and I had goosebumps I think <laughs> that is the definition of like goosebumps for me okay he was walking from his white Tesla like, I can't forget that scene mm -hmm. walking in his white T-shirt and from the white Tesla he comes he stands next to the hyperloop tube and he says go the first hyperloop runs and i mean what better right what better meeting him was like the best ex uh, best experience and actually well just imagine looking at a person and imagining okay this guy runs like three startups he's changing every industry he's touching did you get a chance to talk to him like uh one-on-one -on -one personally or uh, no, 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 like no, 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 okay. no, no, but I'm not giving up for the life is long. So some, someday, <laughs> yeah, I know, I mean, I know the 50 yeah. gold emails that you mentioned after getting to the U S one is definitely <laughs> going to be Elon Musk only. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah, actually. Yeah. No way. Very, very yeah. nice. And, uh, like what, how are these pods different from each other? Let's say you build one, there's a country mm -hmm. like Germany guys, they are building one, etc. So mm -hmm. like, how are they different from each other? Like, is it in terms of speed? Is it in terms of quality or? What are the metrics? Yeah, it could be anything. Uh, it could be like a difference in chassis. We built it with okay. something. They built it with carbon fiber. Somebody building with aluminum. Comf could be the difference in the kind of, uh, let's say, levitational theory they use. It could be, we use magnets. Someone can like, take a different track and it, levitate it using something else, right? It could be the shape. How do you reduce the drag and everything? So again, I'm not the expert in engineering. So I'm not going to say a lot. But I remember there was one which, bring, which, which brought a hyperloop with wheels also. So they were like, uh, we don't even have about levitation. I want it with wheels. We can still achieve like a very high speed. And they did exceptionally well. I think it was a German team which did that. So it was like a take, like your take. So like you don't have to stick by it. It's like art. They built like different sorts of uh, hyperloops. Uh, and I mean, 
I, I still believe ours was the closest to what Elon wanted. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Yeah. Very, very cool. And what is the other project you were talking about? Uh, so, yeah, I think a couple of other projects I did in college. One was, I remember, uh, so I, I was in my hometown once and I was walking, I was trying to park my car and I remember seeing a car parked outside my house. And I was like, what is this? Like, in a, in a, how can people be so irresponsible? And I think back then I started thinking of an idea, right? I thought, okay, one should have an application, one app. Imagine Pokemon Go, right? Uh, you have a camera, you have a phone. Why can't you just report violations like this in front of you? Why don't you just report this traffic violation? It goes to the nearest traffic police officer and you become a virtual cop. You are doing something good for the society. And then this guy who is an offender in a way uh, gets caught and you help police, right? So we started building this application. I and one of my school friend and one of my college friend, I remember, we participated in a smart city innovation challenge. Uh, it was run by KPIT. Uh, we ended up winning that uh, through this application. So uh, some German judge was there. He connected a lot with it. He said, okay, there's a refugee crisis going on. This will help personal safety. Why are you restricting it just to, let's say, traffic police? You should build it out for... Uh, safety in general. So that was one pet project. And interestingly, I talked about the same project in my Stanford application, I think which we'll cover later. Yeah. How I still want to bring that as a reality. Imagine like, uh, in a, in, so in India, the the ratio of police officers to, hum, to, to civilians is skewed, right? So there's no way they can be everywhere. So what is the way they can know what is happening, right? It's, it's probably our responsibility to help, like, catch, help them know what where the violations are happening. At the same time, just imagine the amount of data will, which will be generated, right? Every day, imagine a city like, let's say, Chandigarh, which is so organized. So after like a month, they just sit down, go through the data and they realize, okay, 7 p.m., this sector has a lot of violations. So let me just reallocate my police force accordingly so that we can help people, right? So the idea was to do something like that where people, instead of catching just Pokemons and getting that dopamine kick, actually catch some offenders and like help in the improvement of the society. So that was one other project which I still remember. We, I, I got my first paycheck back then and we ended up winning the competition. We got some 5 lakh rupees. Nice. Uh, uh, so that was another very, very... Again, again that is something which again, uh, I think, re-emphasized my belief in innovation. And again, that innovation theme uh, is part of my HBS essay. So uh, you talk about what matters most to you. So I talked about innovation, right? How innovation mm. actually played a very pivotal role in my life. So that was one other project. I got very, I'm actually grateful. Uh, Bitsalani gave me the opportunity to head the placement unit as well. So we did a couple of new initiatives there. We started calling. So what you are doing, we started calling alumni who from uh, like three, four years of industry experience back to college. So they can talk to the students on campus and these students can begin very early in college. And like awareness will help them to prepare better, right? So suppose I got to know about consulting in my fourth year. What if somebody gets to know about it in first year, right? So he, they, they come across a McKinsey consultant who is from Bitspilani, who has been working in the industry and they get inspired and they learn more. Uh, the earlier you start, the better you become, I believe, right? So yeah. we did this whole alumni talks where people came, talked about different industries. I think the NP, the people people really liked it. The NPS, the net promoter score was really high for, right. for this type of lecture series. Uh, we started a junior placement committee, which helped right. organize the, the internship season a little better. So I think I remember everything I remember is because of the small initiatives which we took, thinking that, okay, this will make things even better. So Bits Pelani that way was very, very enriching. They give right. you the freedom to do whatever you want. Correct. No, I can uh, very well uh, resonate to what you're saying. And plus, I think uh, that is one of the reasons why a lot of these uh, successful founders and startup entrepreneurs are also from colleges like Bitspilani or let's say an IIT, yeah. IIT Bombay, etc. Because yeah. their entrepreneurial culture is imbibed right from their college days and right from I the agree. time they are entering the college. So that is something which yeah. is phenomenal. And uh, yeah. goes to you for these projects as well. I had no idea about that. You have worked on projects like Hyperloop and building an application which will penalize uh, the person who is violating laws and regulations. But uh, yeah. I'm glad, I, I'm, I won't I'm. be surprised after, let's say, 15, 20 years down the line, if you uh, once you build a unicorn where people will ask you, how did you start <laughs> your entrepreneurial journey? And you'll be like, I started all of this, but it's still not here. That is <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I hope definitely. after 15, after 15 years, I hope it's a Decacon. It's not still a unicorn. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> my bad. Apologies. My bad. <laughs> yeah. So I think yeah, let's talk about, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, you were yeah. saying something? No, I was just saying, I think uh, very well said. A bit spilani, I remember a lot of my friends also, uh, they, ne they never got uh, like stopped by what degree they were pursuing. Yeah. They were, they were being driven by their interests. 
Correct. Uh, and a lot of startups are coming out of Bitspill, and I'm really, really proud what students are doing. I right. still remember uh, a second year student reaching out to me. I thought he wants some help on resume, but he wanted funding. <laughs> so the culture is definitely changing. Uh, right. It was not like this, like when I was in college, but it's in changing for good. Right. Yeah. That, that's that's a very good anecdote. Huh? <laughs> they don't want the resume. They want funding now. <laughs> yeah. They want funding now. They want yeah. to hire. They would. He would have hired me by the end of the call. Yeah. He was so confident. <laughs> I liked speaking to him. <laughs> very nice. Cool. So let's talk about your post Bitspilani journey now. You got into uh, McKinsey, and uh, let's yeah. talk about your experience at McKinsey. What are some of the things yeah. that McKinsey taught you? Maybe if you can share some uh, project that you have done at McKinsey, of course, without discussing sure. some of the client, that will also be super helpful. Yeah, yeah, sure, definitely. I think McKinsey is uh, McKinsey in one line is throwing you at the deep end of the pool without a life tube, and you have to just drown or survive or come to the shore end. Right? So uh, that is what the experience was. I think two, three things which I remember extremely fondly from my McKinsey journey. One is the kind of people or the rooms you are in. Right? People are talk. People are. people have achieved something in life right uh, and all of them are extremely humble and yet ambitious and they all are pursuing their hobbies and still doing some great stuff in college and you can't help but get inspired you i i was grateful for every day i had spent in mckinsey i was like there was a little bit of imposter syndrome kicking in but i was like wow what, what a what a quality of talent which mckinsey hires and uh, what what great people to know and be friends with for a long period of time right secondly uh, it's it is said that one year in mckinsey is like three years in industry especially right out of college right uh, you get to i was working with a mining player and i was sitting every month we all were sitting every month a team of five six people with the ceo or the or the group and telling him what to do right like us imagine like two three months out of college that sort of exposure really pushes you uh, out of your comfort zone and you learn a lot and then there are some hard and soft skills which you of course learn right uh i mean learning how to do modeling where like excel modeling not modeling modeling uh, learning how to do excel <laughs> modeling where Thanks learning for how to that <laughs> learning how to yeah, i don't want to mislead people uh, <laughs> learning how to uh think in structure i think structured thinking is an underrated skill uh being able to be very messy which is mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive when you're thinking about problems right uh that case study method that thinking in a structure really helps you to maximize impact and in- decrease the time to value you reach the value faster uh the problem solving toolkit so to say right uh is an art it's it can be learned but i think best learned as an apprentice under some person who has already been there and done that so those are the hard skills the soft skills is of course i i i still am an introvert but i was a bigger introvert back then uh mckinsey taught me how to put yourself out there talk to people talk in front of clients present your point right and be very emphatic when you're presenting it so i think in terms of the skills also and lastly i think the exit opportunity which a mckinsey consultant gets right we i could never imagine like if i look 5 years back i could never imagine even working for a vc fund now i think the landscape is different but uh, um i think mckinsey puts you and instead to get that opportunity getting into a pe fund a vc fund and a strategy role and a chief of staff role so i think it's it's a gift which just keeps giving i think mckinsey i'm totally indebted and i'm still very grateful for the kind of uh, alumni network which it opens right so um, i think mckinsey was a very very insightful experience uh, one study which i remember extremely fondly and which changed the course of my career going forth was you get to work with fortune 500 players that we all know but i was working with one of the largest uh, fantasy sports player of the country can't take name but i, or, or, I hope you know what i'm talking yeah, about yeah. it was a startup the experience was thrilling because it was not like us presenting the founder what to do and the founder taking a month of approval to do that i remember telling the founder okay this is one asset you should not acquire he was trying to acquire a player in a new vertical he picked up the phone and he called the player and he said the deal is off that is the first time i realized the importance of a mckinsey wow. advice and how fast and how quick it can be executed and how how much work we need to do so that we don't take the right wrong decision right uh, so i think that secondly the energy i think the founder used to think big when you are in a startup you are and that ca- startup was not capital constrained not constrained in terms of talent they want to do big they, they want to conquer the world i think that energy or that belief was probably is pr- probably missing from large conglomerates because they are a little set in their ways right they have to they have a shareholder responsibility uh, they can't just go wild and pick new verticals and jeopardize everything right but this 
energy was something which really caught on. And I think in general, the way the founder used to conduct the team and the way he used to run the meetings, I, I got a, I learned a lot and I thought that, okay, startup world is probably my next adventure. Uh, hence, I moved to a VC fund. Uh, but yeah, I think that was one study which I remember very fondly. Not to take away anything from other studies, everything I got to learn something, but this was probably the best of the lot. So how many years you worked in McKinsey? Yeah, one and a half years. Uh, right. Precisely one and a half years. Yeah. And at what stage uh, of your career in McKinsey, you decided that you want to take a plunge and you want to shift to a venture capital? So after doing the study, which I just spoke about, yeah. uh, I think that is when I decided that, okay, I think, uh, and a lot of, we got we get a lot of inbound interest also. I think uh, we were lucky back then that a lot of headhunters were calling us with opportunities in VC. Uh, so I decided to do VC because I wanted to be a generalist and still look at many sectors. Uh, so I think after the study, I decided and we started interviewing with different funds and Matrix was the first fund which I interviewed with and uh, got lucky. So, yeah. Got it. I think you're just being modest. <laughs> you you didn't get lucky. It was because of your <laughs> talent and hard work which mm. you've done over the last few years that made you in. No, no, I think it's a combination. It's always a combination. <laughs> right. Yeah. So yeah, talk talk us more uh, like talk more about your experience of uh, interviewing at uh, Matrix and Axel, and uh, yeah. then we'll cover about your experience at both these funds as well. Sure, sure. Yeah. So uh, I think this is a question which I used to get a lot. Uh, yeah. People aspire to be in VC because it puts you in a good position to help founders, talk to a lot of founders, know about the latest theses which are going on, for example. Uh, and the reason why I also did it was that there's one thing to read about technology, there's one thing to know, okay, what can be built and do that second order thinking, uh, right? And that is the opportunity which VC presents you with. VC helps you to uh, talk to a lot of founders who are building innovative stuff. Uh, it helps you to have a point of view by talking to experts, by talking to operators, by talking to founders to know what can be built right. Uh, and I mean, we can never be right. Of course, the founders are the one, we can never be fully right. Founders are the one build, building it, but we have some point of view on every space. Okay, what can be built, why it can be built, what is the right to win, why it should be built out of India, who should the customer be, what is the pain point you should be solving. So this, is, this was very exciting for me, right? Now, uh, coming to how a VC interview is, uh, so I think I'll just cover two things, what a VC job is like and also what a VC interview is like. So I think uh, broadly, the whole value chain as a VC analyst is that there are four or five things. You source a company, uh, then you evaluate the company. If you like the company, you go deeper and do due diligence. Uh, uh, you build multiple theses so that you know what sector are you targeting. And if you end up investing in the company, that becomes your portfolio. So there's portfolio management, right? Uh, you might be talking to like, let's say 100 startups a month, right? Back in the day uh, when, I mean, the funding was at its peak, you end up diligencing probably very seriously to, to a month. You evaluate most of them, but like very few reach the stage where you are on the verge of investing in them, right? So depending on the VC fund, the amount of time you spent in each of these buckets can be different. Some funds want you to be sourcing heavy, like you spend 50% of your time talking to new startups. Some funds want you to be heavy on, let's say, thesis and portfolio. So you might spend like 50% of your time doing portfolio work, helping founders who, have already, uh, who are already part of your fund's investment to scale or solve problems, right? So this is the value chain, but again, the work can vary depending on the VC fund you're working for, right? Everyone has different expectations. So that is what the job is. Uh, in terms of the interview, I remember what you have to do is, and it might have updated slightly, but it's broadly the same. You pick up a couple of sectors you're very interested in. Let's say you pick up a Shopify ecosystem, right? Uh, you, a lot of new apps are coming up, which are helping uh, sellers sell better online, right? Or let's say you pick up a sector like a legacy sector like fintech and you talk about how lending or new theses in lending are coming up right so you go really deep you build a point of view and you tell uh, and you in the interview you say okay this is the sector which i have picked and then you talk about what's new what are the early stage startups which are coming up in this sector and how one should evaluate or invest in them so that is one part of the interview second is of course you talk about why vc and that's a very very important question right uh, why do you really want to do vc right uh, is it when, would you even enjoy the job it's a it's a lonely job right mckinsey was a team setting then you move to a vc job where you're the solo analyst working on a deal probably with one manager and one partner so you need to be very clear about the reasons why you want to do vc 
So I think broadly these two things and third is the fit. Right. Uh, every fund operates in a certain way. So they want to check whether this person will be a good fit for the fund as well, fund or not. Right. Like different. If one could enjoy portfolio work more, one could enjoy sourcing work more. Uh, one would have different values from the fund or the same value of the fund. So there's a fit component also, which they're actively evaluating. So broadly, these three things. Now, how do you prepare for them? Uh, I think you listen to a lot of podcasts. Matrix Pod, Matrix has a very good podcast series. A sixteen Z, which is Anderson Horowitz, have a great podcast series. Axel has a great podcast series. These funds they actively put out a lot of their uh, like prepared minds, the thesis which they are working on out there, so that founders can read and come to them. Right. So be be very thorough. Read about that. Read about the latest funding announcements. It helps to be plugged into the ecosystem to to know that okay, my friends are starting up or uh this vc is thinking that way so talk to people right learn about what's new how to how to how be, be updated have a network right so if if sourcing is going to be part of your job you have to make a very robust network right how do you do that my bits and friends i talk to them right are they starting up are they not why are we not or thinking in that direction so having a network also helps so yeah i think that's that's broadly uh how the Processes again. That's how you prepare for it. The process can be different depending on fund to fund. There are usually three, four individual interviews. There's one thesis round where you present a thesis and defend it in front of the committee or the whole investment team. And finally, uh, yeah, I think uh, they take a call whether you did well or not. So that's right. the whole process. Got it. This is very helpful, and uh, I'm sure like a lot of people will get to know how to prepare. Just one quick question here. Uh, you mentioned about the podcast. Is there any specific newsletter or any uh, reading item which you will recommend everyone to like subscribe to? Yeah. Or... Well, I think uh, in, both in India and US there are some great funds putting great great uh, like material out there. I think Anderson Horowitz uh, a sixteen z dot com. One should go check out. They have. They put great content. Uh, I mean, off late they had have written a lot of content about artificial intelligence, generative AI, right? Uh, in general, uh, so there are other funds. Bessemer has put some great content about SaaS uh, in India. I'm a big fan of both the the kind of material which Axel puts out, the kind of material which Matrix puts out. So, uh, in terms of newsletters, I think there are some so twitter is also a very good source i think uh, if you follow the founders operators uh, they put a lot of content again because twitter is probably the place where you go and try to build an audience so that people know what you're working on uh, a lot of good content from comes from twitter as well but i think these are the three four funds which are doing great work in putting the content out got it and the ones that you mentioned about axel and matrix is it like available free of cost on the website or on their social media oh yeah just go to youtube and uh, check it. for the podcast of both of these funds They're quite amazing right i think access started this seed to scale uh, initiative right uh, where they are yeah, yeah. a lot of founders yeah there are multiple multiple such there's a marketplace series there's a ah, okay. uh, i mean something or the other keeps coming out and it's very thorough uh, i mean both people who are just starting out or people who are deep into the industry will uh, gain something from it right Uh, can you also help us in terms of what uh, what were the questions which you were asked in your interviews and how did you tackle them? Ah, uh, okay. So I remember being asked. So I picked up an industry, right? Ah, uh, I had to talk about what is going on in that industry. What is the latest thesis which you think ah uh, startups are following, right? Ah, uh, I picked up a couple of startups and evaluated them as best as I could, and I was grilled on that. Mm-hmm. I was asked out of the investments which that fund has made, what is my favorite and my worst. pick okay. like which one i would have definitely done which one i wouldn't have done i remember this question and it stuck with me which indian startup are you a, are you a big fan of and a power user of i remember answering zero tha back then uh, or i use it almost on a daily basis so uh, swiggy uh, is another right so things like that and then in general uh, why do you want to join vc what do you want to achieve out of it uh, what is your next step how are you thinking so and and Like what's your network like? That's that's something which is not actively asked, but they try to gauge, right? right? How plugged in are you in the industry? What what can you bring for the founders? At the end of the day, I think we are serving founders, right? So uh, knowing how best we can help them, right? Is there some kind of experience from your past or something you have learned which can actually help them? Uh, is also I think a theme of the interviews of late. Right. So you see a lot of product managers, a lot of operators. Not just consultants uh, as part of VC funds, right? Because they they bring their own thinking, and VC job is a very first principles job. You have to, uh, you don't have to bring your biases in, right? If a founder is telling you this can work, you have to actually th- be step in his shoes and think, okay, what are the reasons this can work? It's very easy to say this won't work, but I think the trick is to figure out how it will work 
and yeah. catching that early right that is where the uh, inter- the the skewed outcomes come from right what would be the general salary ranges uh, at what hierarchy in these vc funds if you can help us understand uh, that yeah so i think uh, so there's a fixed component and there's a variable component uh, adding both i think most of the vc funds at an entry level offer like 50 lakhs plus to all the analysts today right back then it was not that much i guess when i had joined but today it is definitely like either 50 or more than 50 uh, it can go up to probably 70 75 as well some of the funds are very generous in terms of the variables which they right uh, and also it depends a little bit on the fund performance as well i have seen where some some of the funds are doing exceptionally well they pay little better than others right so but generally you are paid extremely well i remember jumping from mckinsey to vc and getting like a 3 3x salary jump so i think the the skew is definitely there right and what is like generally the variable percentage in the sense that like does it range from 10 to 20 or it can go up to 50 and 100 percentage as well yeah uh, it can it goes up to 50 some some funds give up to 100 also i think later stage and so i think uh, later stage of investing which i'm not the best to talk about but they pay even higher the variables are even higher because the kind of investments which they take and kind of returns is the thing rate are even more got it got it so i think from yeah. what i understand is like at an entry level role in a top tier vc anyone can expect between let's say 50 to 75 fixed component and the variable can go from let's say 30 to 50 if i can put it this way uh no i think combination of variable and fixed will be between 50 and 75 oh, uh, combination of both yeah, yeah combination so fixed would be let's say could be anything between 30 to 50 and okay. uh, up it. to 50 to 100 percent could be the variable got it makes sense makes sense yeah. helpful and uh, like uh, in terms of your work experience at axel as well as matrix partners so of course not talking about any specific deal as such but uh, what are like some of the projects that uh, you had worked on which one would be your most favorite and how was that entire experience which uh, helped you in order to get into a b school as well ultimately yeah do no, axel i think give me a lot of good opportunity good opportunities to work and they give you a lot of freedom so i remember working so there were three things which i think three buckets again one is uh um, portfolio work so got a chance to be get a ringside seat to a lot of good startups right and you see those startups uh taking down targets one by one like building the presence in india then building it abroad and like scaling like anything being capital efficient hiring talent so just imagine the amount of learning which is there when you are even sitting as a board observer on these meetings right so i think in terms of the portfolio opportunities that adding some value to these essentially like whatever analysis they want you to help with or maybe some due diligence if they are going to acquire a new asset so it could be anything you are essentially like a chief of staff to them let's say and they could they could leverage you in anything but at the same time you also get to learn from their uh, experiences uh, while you add value in terms of the, uh, investments i think i got i got very lucky i got a chance to make four to five investments which i had sourced across different verticals so one was in gaming one was in fintech one was in manufacturing saas one was in saas in general so i think the just the opportunity to find a deal uh, have a have a thesis in that space first that this is how why this will work uh, working with the founder and even evaluating and going deep into understanding why is he building this how this will change the market uh, how will he win his customers right i think that that whole thing is very liberating you mm-hmm. learn a lot from the founder and then you champion that deal right you have you know the most if you brought that deal so you bring your point of view you put it in front of the investment committee uh, you tell them why this can work and in a way you are championing the deal right and at, in the same way same at the same time they are telling you what are the risks why this can work it cannot work why this might work so like leading that whole process and at the end of the and end of this whole hard work of one one and a half months seeing that deal happening and uh, then working with the founder to help them scale is is a very very exciting journey right uh, so that is, that is another then lastly you also work in a work with a lot of uh, in a lot of firm initiatives so i remember one firm initiatives where i was uh, working with a lot of angel investors and making sure that we are in active touch with them knowing where they are investing letting them know where we are investing and figuring out how we can be of value add to them so yeah i think we also organized a couple of uh, meetups one was for the chief of staff so chief of there were multiple chief of staff in india we brought them under one roof and we ran a very exciting uh, event for them where they could ask their questions from people who had gone from being a chief of staff to a ceo right uh, so we did such things and i think uh, very very exciting 
We yeah. also, I also remember organizing Bitsian's Day back back then, where we called a lot of Bitsian founders and people who were doing really well in the industry and brought them under one roof and talk about new ideas. Right. I'm sure your network would have increased like manifold after getting into a VC, right? That is uh, like something. Which yeah, was... I think it gives you an opportunity to talk to people across industries, across sectors, across stages. Yeah. So it actually helps, and it's a job where you are needed to actively build a network, right? To be yeah. at the helm of things, right? So it did help. Yeah. No, I remember. So when I was also working at Aditya Billa Ventures, which is a newly set up. Yeah. So a lot of lot of times we used to have like a lot of other events where we just had to network with founders, understand what what they are building what stage yeah. they are in their uh, career or their startup right now and uh, right. actively networking like that's the best way of sourcing deals in my opinion as well rather than always getting into end track attraction and just <laughs> getting a list of startups <laughs> that is something which yeah. i did not like honestly <laughs> but yeah, of yeah. course everyone has a personal viewpoint and opinion. yeah i think uh, 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 you get you also do things which you don't like but i think that's part yeah. of the job <laughs> that's yeah. how you're getting paid yeah, but I think right. VC was one job which I really like. So right. I would love, would love to. I mean, love the job. Would love to get an opportunity to do work again in this. No, I think you'll love to get an opportunity to uh, make a make a pitch to these VCs where you have worked. <laughs> and of course, like I'm sure yeah. you want to convert and close them as well <laughs> once you get <laughs> back true. from Harvard. Let's see. Let's see. No. Fingers crossed. Yeah, very <laughs> interesting. So now let's talk about your uh, MBA journey. Now you have uh, decided that you want to get into an MBA and with yeah. your background and with your stellar academic profile, stellar work profile as well. I think Harvard, Stanford, Wharton or the Ivy League was something which was always there at the back of your mind. So tell me one thing, like when did you decide you want to do an MBA? At what stage of your career you were at, uh, you were at in Axel? And then let's talk about your entire application journey as well. How did you approach and all of that? Sure. Sure. Uh, so... When did I decide? I think you end up applying after having like three to four years of work experience, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah, I remember... Is it mandatory to have three to four years of work experience? This is also a common question. I've seen people, people get in with lesser also, mm-hmm. but to be best placed and to maximize your odds, I think three to four years is the sweet spot, okay. right? Uh, so I, I think three to four years is when people actually start... Uh, thinking of applying so they start they probably begin a year earlier right mm. uh, so i i think i remember when i had just joined axel is when i started thinking okay i will also apply for an mba mm. uh, so i think first year i worked at axel uh, and then second year is the is when i started putting in the efforts to bring this whole puzzle together right uh, so there's there's a lot of things a lot of things that go into an mba application uh, so we can talk about that so this is the timeline broadly when I started thinking of applying. Uh, so why why do I want to apply? I think over time, uh, things have changed. I think uh, it's not that an MBA will only get you a good job in India, right? It's 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 no longer a deterrent. Uh, probably, uh, it's, skill is what matters more, right? But I think at the same time, few things which I believe I would stand to gain from an MBA degree are, let's say, one is meeting a lot of new people, right? Uh, this is, has been one theme in my life where I have learned a lot by being inspired from other people, like how they are conducting themselves. And this has been when I moved from Jammu to Bitspilani. This has been when I moved from Bitspilani to McKinsey or McKinsey to Axel. So I'm just hopeful that I will meet even more inspiring people at a global stage. And that will give me a good network of professional uh, acquaintances and also a lot of friends, right? Um, and secondly, I think I will learn a lot more about things outside of my field as well, right? I will, so from what I've learned, there are people from the US military who are joining MBA. There are people from Netflix who are joining MBA. So just imagine somebody from a military talking about his experience and somebody from a creative field talking about his or her experience, right? Uh, it would be like, I am hopeful it will be mind opening, right? Yeah. Uh, so and I, I'm open to serendipity also. Hopefully I'll meet my co-founder there. I don't know what will happen, right? Uh, third, I think in general, getting a flavor of how the US markets operate, uh, right? Uh, why is it that a lot of good technology innovations, right, uh, are happening there and just getting, just being there and hoping that uh, I can also be a part of uh, something very, very meaningful, right? Nothing to take away from India. I think some great work is happening. Uh, but again, I think the US also brings a lot of flavor. The technology market is so big. A lot of people who build in India still aspire to sell to the US, right? Given that they, all the enterprise customers are out there. So I think, and in general, I think the education, the, I'm, I'm so sorry I'm saying education at last, but I think education is also something which is really important. I think formally I will read about 
finance and marketing and yeah. sales and accounting and whatnot and um, that and through that too through a case study uh, method which i'm really excited to see how it happens right uh, so yeah i think all in all it's 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 a two year uh, fun and pressure packed environment and i'm i'm hoping i come out an individual who has learned a lot and met new people from what from where i am today so and and people debate a lot on the mba right how does it pay in the short term how does it pay out in the long term so i think uh, there's, there's no right or wrong answer right uh, no i think i'm sure i mean uh, that particular diversity which you'll get in an uh, international mba i think that is something which is definitely uh, worthwhile to go over there and go for two years uh, let's talk about your uh, preparation journey as well so now you have to sure. prepare for your gmat you also have to start with your applications how is that process when is it started usually like you leave your job but you have to start before leaving your job itself so when is that usually yeah, started so, and then how did you prepare for it yeah uh, so you start the whole preparation while you're at the job right and you do not leave until you get an admit right because there's no certainty uh, so first of all there's a decision to apply then you decide how many colleges that, that you will apply to right so out of the top 7 colleges people usually apply to like uh four at once in one round uh then you choose your mba consultant i think working with a consultant is really important because it's again it's like a person who has the who has the map and the compass you know he or she knows uh what to do what not to do what language to use and they have done it and seen it over like thousand applications so they are like chat gpt of applications <laughs> um uh so you decide on the consultant i started working with a foreign consultant she was based in israel uh got her referral from one of my uh, seniors and at excel who had converted harvard business school uh so you do all that and then you decide on the round so there are two rounds every year when you can apply most of the schools have two rounds some have three also but round 1 and round 2 uh the intake is something like people say it's 50 50 but i don't know i think much must be 60% of applicants go in first round and 40 in round 2 uh so i think so that's the broad timeline round 2 you end up applying in september round 1 you end up applying in september round 2 you end up applying in january uh so i decided i started initially preparing for round 1 but then i couldn't put like all the pieces of the puzzle which is like recommendations gmat your application your uh, whole everything like putting together right uh, by round 1 in a satisfactory manner so i decided that i'll do it in round 2 uh so now what are the components of this uh, whole journey right gmat is one Uh, a lot of people don't know this but you can also get gre right uh, and weight is you can take any exam right i ended up taking gmat uh, and then after gmat you cash in your social capital you ask your manager that you are applying so you get the recommendation there are usually two recommendations that you need to get so one has to come in most of the schools one has to come from your sitting manager second can come from like a previous manager in my case that could have been some mckinsey partner or manager i worked with or in what i ended up doing was i had worked with some partner in mckinsey who ended up starting up and we invested in him during our axel journey so he had seen a whole spectrum of my journey right so anyone who is in a position to talk about your qualities and your uh, work experience in a very very good manner right in an in- interesting way uh, so a lot of people might be like let's say x uh, from a very good b school and have the pedigree to write a very good recommendation but at the same time they do not have the time or the bandwidth to write a good one so you have to maintain a balance between the quality of the recommendation and the quality of the recommender so this was the sweet spot for me so again uh, as help them uh, while putting together a recommendation letter most of the uh, heavy lifting has to be done by the candidate by the way huh? so it's not like you tell them that this is the format and you write the recommendation everyone nobody is writing recommendation day in and day out so you have to help them think through go through multiple iterations i think there were like five six iterations of the recommendation letters which i wrote alone uh, after that the biggest thing which probably people spend the most time on is the b school essay right the essay prompt is totally different from ours for all schools for harvard it is what should i know more about you which is as open as it gets right and uh, till last year they never gave a word limit also they say the word limit was 900 words so this is something where you talk to them about what is probably there or not there on your cv it could be about your values it could be about your journey it could be about who you are it could be who has influenced you it could be anything so that is one thing where you do a lot of self introspection to begin with like what has been my journey been like from like childhood till now 
what have been the pivotal moments what are the things which define me who are the people who have played a big role where have i created impact out of this you pick different stories right you pick three stories and you figure out what is the theme across them and then you put up an essay essay which talks about who you really are to the b school right uh, so in my case i think since i've been talking for a while i think i picked innovation as a theme i talked about my hyperloop journey the app which i had built in mckinsey also i did a couple of things which pro- qualified as some form of innovation right uh, then in axel of course you talk, work with so many uh, founders that you are in a way helping them and working with them and innovating in some capacity so that essay itself takes you don't take it lightly that takes like one one and a half months to put in uh 35 iterations is what i went through people go through lesser or more depending on how quickly they can get to a good essay uh you work with a consultant you show it to multiple people who have been part of your journey right and tell them how it is and after multiple rounds of feedback you actually lock in an essay so essay is there uh recommendations are there your gmat is there and gmat again don't take lightly i think i gave multiple attempts uh, i remember taking multiple attempts then there's your cv right that's not the cv which you have been using till now for applications there's a proper format which you have to follow right right things very thoroughly pick and choose right it's it's an under uh, it's 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 overwhelming to put everything in one page one page is more than enough but at the same time deciding what to keep what to cut how to project and how to write and uh, covering everything right that's all that also takes a lot of time i think 2 2 3 weeks you can um, schedule for like just preparing your cv so all in all i think end to end if you have your gmat score in place which itself will take 2 3 months you take like good 2 2 and a half to 3 months for preparing your application right so i remember picking up again in september september october november good part of december uh, and of course towards the end you put in more effort so it's a very very active engagement and the the, the the hardest part is you have to do it with your job right your your job won't be like okay bandit is submitting his application of course let's hire a backup no right so if they are writing recommendation for you you need to keep up the performance which uh, help got you to the recommendation so i think people were extremely helpful i think uh my friends from mckinsey my mentors from mckinsey uh then people who have gone to harvard from axel uh then a lot of my friends who knew me my family i think a lot of support a lot of feedback on what you're doing goes through this entire process um uh, a lot of guidance people who had submitted their applications in the past calling them and asking them like how should i do it and they they actually actively sharing even the resources uh of what they use so that you can do it better uh, i mean that was very very helpful uh so once this whole process is done then comes the hardest part which is waiting you submit your application then you sub- wait for like a month to know acha are you getting an interview or not so so i of course i had applied to harvard stanford wharton and mit i got an interview from harvard stanford and wharton uh so i i talked about harvard i think stanford and wharton are slightly different uh wharton has a different prompt altogether you need to talk about there are two essays first of all you need to talk about how wharton will be helpful to you you need to go through their whole course and curriculum and understand what courses will be beneficial to you and whatever long and short term goal you're planning to uh achieve right so harvard also has a small dialog box to write your long term goal but it's not like a biggie in case of wharton you need to really really think through your long and short term goals right um so that is another thing stanford is like another game altogether they talk about uh what they, they talk about something different right uh, so harvard is what should we know more about you stanford is what matters the most to you why stanford right um again i think word limit is also there in stanford essay stanford has like two two big essays four small essays so it takes a lot of time to build the stanford application and a lot of people don't applying to stanford because they take some esoteric profiles so to say right uh, uh say they want to see something different why you really really want to come to stanford do the values resonate so yeah but yeah i think what took the most time for me was writing what matters most to you and why for harvard followed by wharton followed by stanford uh so i got a chance to interview with these three schools Sta- uh, stanford and harvard do proper interviews i flew to dubai to do an in person interview for harvard stanford uses their alumni they don't use their admission committee to do the interviews it's a little different uh wharton has a whole different process they have a group discussion right so again i think interviews happened uh, after that i got into uh, i got into harvard and wharton 
uh, and I got a waitlist at Stanford. So that's that's how the journey was altogether. But this is very helpful. Uh, so maybe it'll also be uh, super helpful to understand about your uh, GMAT preparation strategy and. Uh, uh, if you can yep. uh, just share with everyone what was your GMAT score as well, <laughs> that'll help people to. Uh, <laughs> so I, I did not like have a super super GMAT score. I applied to a seven thirty, uh, and I think Stanford and Harvard are a low, little more score agnostic. This is no advice to not have a good GMAT score. FYI, they are a little more score agnostic, and other schools like MIT, Wharton are more finicky about the, your GMAT score, right? So definitely aim to have a as high GMAT score as possible. Uh, what goes into the preparation, I remember there's verbal, there's quant. So verbal, I think quant is something which engineers are proud of uh, having a head start in, but it also takes a lot of effort to brush up those concepts and be very, very uh, time bound, right? When you're solving those questions, of course, I can solve those questions in hundred minutes, but solving them in the given time limit is what takes a lot of practice. Uh, within verbal, I remember working with a GMAT coach, uh, right, uh, to begin with, and then GMAT club is an extremely, extremely good resource. They, people, it's a forum where people have posted GMAT questions and they talk about how to solve them. Uh, the idea is in verbal specifically, you do as many questions, you make a log of your mistakes and you never repeat the mistakes and you be very, very consistent. You do GMAT prep every day, no matter it's 30 minutes is one hour, do it every day for a period of like one, one and a half months. And then. Uh, yeah, you appear for the GMAT, which is, uh, I think the format is changing now for GMAT. So my, mine was a little different. There were 60 minutes of verbal, 60 minutes of quant. Uh, there's IR, integrated reasoning. And then finally, there is AWA where you have to write a small essay. So all in all, it was a three and a half hour uh, exam. I think starting round two this year, the format is also changing if I'm not wrong. Uh, but yeah, I think preparation is quite intense. Uh, I think verbal, especially me who was an engineer, uh, not the best in verbal to begin with, took a lot of effort. So put in the time, put in the effort and be very, very consistent. I think those are the advice. There are enough and more than more resources out there. Uh, but yeah, I think use the right resource. Use only official GMAT questions. Don't, don't fish too far. Right. Uh, I think the, if you are, if you are consistent and if you put in the effort, uh, and you don't repeat the same mistake. I think you end up getting to your dream score faster. Right. And uh, you had an interview with uh, all these three universities, Harvard, Stanford, and Wharton. Yeah. yeah. Got it. So if you can walk us through your interview experience as well in each of these three, and again, what sure. kind of questions you were asked, what did you answer? That'll be helpful. Uh, so uh, I remember Harvard is like a rapid fire interview. It's 30 minutes, 30 questions. So they can ask anything, right, in your resume. It, it depends a little bit on the, the format depends a little bit on who your interviewer is. It can be more work experience focused. It can be more extracurriculars focused. It could be anything. So you just at times prepare for different interview styles. You have to be extremely thorough with your resume and CV. They can pick anything, ask you what you did, why you didn't keep drilling down till they have an answer. Uh, so prepare for everything and not just your CV. Like you need to know about the industry in general. So why is VC industry in India booming? Uh, why will it work? Or why is, what is Axel doing? Why is it doing? What is the fund strategy? Why did you do these investments, right? Uh, what is your leadership style like, right? Uh, why did you do these extracurriculars? What has really shaped you? What is your long-term goal? It could be anything. So you have to prepare for everything. I think Harvard interview was one of the hardest interviews I've ever prepared for, but at the end of it, the conversation was amazing. Like I, I enjoyed the, so you have to deal, deal with it like a conversation. It has to be free flowing. The idea is you don't hoard information. They want you to represent your, your like pool of applicants, which is VC consulting in the Harvard classroom. So if they ask you, give the information out like really well, don't hoard anything, tell them as much as you know, so that others in the classroom can learn from your experience. So that's the whole funda behind the Harvard interview. Uh, you could do it in Zoom, on Zoom or in person. I got the guidance from a friend who had converted Harvard and from my seniors at Axel that I should do it in person if I'm really serious about it. So I flew to Dubai. Um, oh, wow. Stanford was a, yeah, Stanford was very different. Stanford may, they use their alumni to interview you. And the questions are extremely different. It's, I, I would say it's more uh, about who you are as a person in like 45 minutes of your Stanford interview, which can go up to like even one, one and a half hours. There's no limit depending on how it goes, they'll ask you different things. Like why you did something, right? Why I shifted from McKinsey to whatever job I did. 
right? So questions are more around how you think, why you did what you did. And although it's said that Harvard, like 100% weightage is on the interview. If you do that an interview, you get in. If you don't, you don't. Stanford, it's nobody can say, right? If your application is great, you will get in. If your application, of course, you got a call because you did something well in your application, but it's debatable how much weightage the alumni interview actually holds. So, uh, yeah, so that that's, that's that. And Wharton has a GD. So they will give you a topic which you have to uh, sit in a GD with other candidates who have been shortlisting, listed, not necessarily Indians, right? Uh, it, they could be from anywhere on in the world and you hold a topic, you, it's more, it's not just about what you say, it's also about how you conduct yourself. So again, it's a simulation of how you will behave in a classroom. Will you let others speak? Will you snub their voice? Will you give them a platform to express their views? At the same time, will you express your views and still add value? So I think that's, that was my takeaway of what they're trying to keep. So that's sort of what an interview was like. So all interviews are very different. Right. And then after that interview is done, then uh, after how many months or how many days you get to know whether you are selected or not? Yeah, I think one month, one, one and a half month. Yeah, yeah that's when you know, back to back. Uh, Wharton result came, uh, I think three days after that Harvard result came, one day before that Stanford had already come. Mm. So yeah, I think uh, quite lethal that way. <laughs> so <laughs> One, one landmine after another. <laughs> right. <laughs> so uh, out of all these four, like uh, you got offers from... Uh, like you got convert from all of them or how was it? I converted Harvard. I converted Wharton. I'm still waitlisted at Stanford. So okay. hopeful. Let's see what happens. Uh, but yeah, yeah, these three. MIT, I didn't interview with. Oh, okay. Yeah. Got it. And uh, then like, for example, now this waitlist concept would be where if let's say a person drops out, then you will be able to get in there, right? That's what even my guess is. Yeah. And how, yeah. what is but the they, But you still need to. So again, I might be off here. Stanford has a bad size of about 400. Okay. Howard is 800, 850. Warden is a little uh, larger than that. Okay. Yeah. Like somewhere like uh, 900,000. So, yeah. Okay. Or could be 1200. I'm not sure. Uh, okay. uh, but yeah, I think it's it's larger than Harvard for sure. Uh, number of Indians also in Warden is the highest. Come, okay. After that comes Harvard and after that comes Stanford. Uh, and even when you're waitlisted, you need to keep the ad com updated about what you're doing. So they actively oh. evaluate you even during the waitlist because there are multiple people in the waitlist. So, right. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. Any idea how many total people would uh, apply to these universities every year? Like, for example, in round one, right? You started in September. How many people would there, like, uh, would, would have applied and what is the acceptance rate? Yeah, very good question. Uh, and I have no idea. <laughs> so this is something <laughs> okay. which we'll have to go Google and put it out for, okay. the, user, for the listeners. Okay. Got it. No, I was trying to... Uh, Raise you that you yeah. are the top 0.1 percent. You are in the top 0.5 no, no. percentage. No, no. <laughs> that was no, no, there's nothing like that. I think <laughs> some people choose to apply, some people don't. So uh, it's it's not like that. I think, uh, uh, but yeah, I think it is extremely competitive. We right. should uh, acknowledge that. Right. But yeah. No, got it. This is very helpful. I think uh, we've covered almost everything about the preparation journey and uh, the ways of getting into these B schools. Uh, apart from that, maybe we'll have another round of conversation two, three years down the line where we'll discuss about your experience at Harvard or Stanford, wherever you'd yeah. like to go. And For sure. uh, yeah, I think uh, just last things would be like, uh, what do you plan ultimately? Like after uh, coming back from Harvard, then yeah. you have, of course, you mentioned that you want to get into entrepreneurship ultimately. Do you have anything specific in the mind, like which sector or what idea or anything specific? Well, when I am in Howard, I think I what I plan to do is probably uh, in a college environment, probably try out a couple of ideas, uh, hopefully meet people who are like minded and find a co-founder. Mm. Uh, and if things go well, um, I mean, you never know if I if I manage my cash flow really well, I could start up immediately after Howard as well. Uh, I mean, equally, equally excited about maybe getting some work experience in the US before attempting, attempting to start up when I feel most prepared. Um, so yeah, uh, going with a very open mind and I think I have two sectors which I really like. I love gaming. I love SaaS. Uh, so I think would begin to explore those, uh, hmm. if I find some good fit for myself and I mean, good empathy for the customers I'm solving for. So I will stick to that. Have a couple of ideas in mind, but I think nothing concrete yet. Hoping that over the next two years, I'll be able to walk out with more clarity on sector and probably, uh, start immediately. Right. Got it. And I think we disc. Uh, I think we missed out about talking uh, more on scholarship front. Uh, any yep. anything there, like in the sense that uh, how do you apply for scholarship? What are some of the criteria they look at? 
before giving yeah. some tips to students so school dependent i think in wharton it's not about applying again since i am not pursuing wharton i'm not going to comment a lot on it but in the admission letter itself those who got scholarships it was written that this is the scholarship you have backed i did not get any scholar i think it's more dependent on the profile uh, and how the interviews and everything went uh, that's my best guess in harvard you apply for a financial aid after getting through and i got a generous scholarship at harvard like uh, like 40 50% of my academic fee was waived off people have gotten better as well people have gotten worse as well but i think it's totally dependent on uh, a lot of things like um, where you were working what are you planning to do are you coming are you are you bar- are you married are you not who are you looking after and a lot of things right but harvard is very generous stanford i haven't converted uh, so i think after conversion i'll get to know if, if it all that happens right but yeah these schools are quite quite generous when when it comes to app- so if you need a scholarship i in in a school like harvard i think there's no way if you really need it you won't end up getting a good scholarship correct got it and what would be the average fees these consultants usually charge when you leverage their yeah. expertise uh so depends i think so they offer packages if you're applying to four schools uh, i think somewhere between not wrong uh 6000 to 8000 dollars hmm. uh which is like 5 lakh to 7 lakh 5 to 8 kind yeah, of a good. ballpark right hmm. uh indian there could be different for different types of consultant but it's all the all the good ones which you which get filled up really fast uh offer like packages in this range only got it makes sense Oh, uh, perfect. I think one last question which I'd like to ask you towards the end is uh, the same question which I ask every guest of mine. It's a tricky one. You'll have to think before answering, I guess. If you were in the shoes of Kushal and if you were interviewing Vandit, what is that one question you would like to ask him towards the end of the interview? Oh, uh, so I would ask Vandit, uh, who are the people who have really helped and moved your career and significantly and i'll tell you the reason i think yeah. we we underestimate how much influence some people have on our career yeah it's only when we look back we realize that okay this person came at the right time at the right place to help us and guide us and hence we achieved what we did yeah. and the reason i'm saying this is because one needs to actively give back uh it's not a zero sum game we all are expanding the pie and eating a share of it so actively give back uh, don't think of it as a zero sum game uh, right so i think that is one question which i would ask and i think i have a lot of people to thank but i still remember while moving out of college there was a senior of mine named vishnukant pitti he was in mckinsey he helped me navigate the whole process right i was a headless chicken i had no idea how to build a cv i had no idea what a case study is i had no idea how to even like give an interview and from there to converting mckinsey if i were to look back that is one person another friend of mine sanchi who has already interviewed you she has been pivotal in my uh, mba journey so uh, i think i think people people come to uh, give uh, help you a lot right and you should never forget them and we should be grateful and pay it forward so that's right. that's the one question which i would ask myself and now i'll ask you as well kushal who do you <laughs> thank the most <laughs> yeah i think uh, that's a good question honestly uh yeah. i think for me right uh, it, it has been like a very uh, like i don't know it, it's like some part of luck has also played in whatever uh, i am like whatever i have achieved today and apart from them i think a lot of things have started happening in right time at the right place so for example like firstly of course like parents and all like without them i don't think i would yeah. have been able to clear my ca exams and all of that Uh, there are so Makes many sense. incidences that i have shared on my social media that my dad did not used to allow guests to come in my house because i was studying oh, wow. my mom used to ensure that i am like i am given i have i am a very particular person like for example i block calendars you know i block calendars like right. <laughs> every, every time whenever i talk to someone so my mom knows i used to have yeah. my breakfast at 8:30 lunch at 1:30 dinner at 7:30 evening snacks at 5 pm and i used to yes. drink will get 9:30 so basically this was something which was already there so she used to ensure that it's not even a minute late or a minute early because i was mm. that particular while studying that is yeah. those are like one like those are set of people then apart from that even at aditya birla group i think dr ajit rande who was the chief economist when i was uh, his executive assistant he is now the vice right. chancellor at gokhale institute of political science and economics he has been like one of the most uh, for like instrumental persons in uh, my career and all of that he has given me a lot yeah. of advices uh which i have mm-hmm. uh, followed and i think friends like of course like a lot of yeah. them who always inspire me like from my network only i interview them i get get to learn a lot of things from them and uh, they always inspire me in order to give more and become better in my yeah. life 
Amazing, amazing. So, I think yeah, again, yeah. looking, listening at your list, I think I'm uh, sorry to people who have missed out. There have been a lot of more people I would have loved to thank, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I agree. I mean, it's a never-ending list, is what I feel. Yeah. Because somewhere yeah. or the other, some or the other person has really played some or the other role in your life. Correct. 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 So that is Amazing. something which is there. But yeah, thank you so much for doing this. This was super helpful. Yeah, yeah. My pleasure. And, My pleasure. Yeah, you've given a lot of time. Honestly, I hope I could do justice to your time. And uh, yeah, that like thank you so much for doing this once again. All the best. Thank you. Thank you so much. listening at your list i think i'm uh, sorry to people who have missed out there have been a lot of more people i would have loved to thank but yeah uh, yeah i agree I, I mean think... it's a never ending list is what i feel yeah because somewhere yeah. or the other some or the other person has really played some or the other role in your life correct 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 so that is Amazing. something which is there but yeah thank you so much for doing this this was super helpful yeah yeah my pleasure and, my pleasure uh, you have given a lot of time honestly i hope i could do justice to your time and uh, yeah that like thank you so much for doing this once again all the best thank you thank you so much